All right, hello everybody. Welcome back to the comprehensive yet definitely pretty informal study of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. I'm here with Patrick, and uh, today we're going to be starting the real meat of the book. This is the Transcendental Aesthetic. This is what we've been building up to in the introduction, and um, we were looking at it just a few minutes beforehand, and it's uh, definitely a doozy. Um, but yeah, this is like the main part of the book, so I'm excited to get started. Uh, do you have anything to say about it before we uh I spent about three hours one all-nighter trying to figure out the first sentence of this <laughs> with a friend. We were both trying to make any sense of it, and we couldn't. We, we couldn't make any sense of the first sentence. It makes, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. Yeah. And worse than that, now that I do understand what all of this means, the problem is that there's no argument for what he's saying. So it's, this is arguably the worst paragraph in Kant. He saved worst for first, I guess. Yeah, so we'll see. We'll get into it. Um, this isn't too big of a section. This is just the introduction to the Transcendental Aesthetic. Um, the real juicy stuff, I think, uh, is a little later at the end here when the we'll go on uh, first section on space, um, and that's a pretty huge one. But that will be coming. Doozy in what sense? Doozy in the sense of like important, uh, important, and really um, like when you think of like Kant's like Copernican turn, like this is this is yeah, something that like I you, agree. Yeah, yeah. You just used doozy in two different senses. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Kantian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Using the words two different ways <laughs> yeah. without any kind of distinction. Oh god, yeah. I have him like subconsciously his habits just are over with me now, so that'll that'll make explaining this interesting. But um, um anyway. But yeah, you can uh, we can get I'll started. Just get right into it. <clears throat> In whatever way and through whatever means a cognition may relate to objects, that through which it relates immediately to them, and at which all thought as a means is directed as an end is intuition. I just right off the bat we get a we get a tough so, definition of yeah, intuition. Um, but this is very like essential I, I, and important. We need I to spend some time on yeah, this. Yeah, I will stop because he defines approximately four or five terms and yeah. rather than define all of them at once at the end of the paragraph, I'm going to go individually. Yeah, so the that, first that term intuition. believe it or not, this first this first sentence here is supposed to be a definition. It's phrased in a very, very awkward way, mm -hmm. obviously. Classic Kant. That, at which through, that through which it relates immediately to them and at which all thought as a means is directed as an end is intuition. What does it mean? Well, first of all, I'll just tell you what intuition is. Intuition for Kant is what's given to us in our mind, right? It's anything that we don't actively produce in our mind, basically. Um, it's sort of the material our thinking works on. So in practice, an example of that would be if I'm looking at a wall and it's painted blue, the blueness itself is an intuition. I have an intuition of blueness. But that's an example of what Kant would call an empirical intuition. Mm -hmm. And it's weird. He gets, says that there's something else that's basically given to us that we don't think, which we're going to get into, but that's space and time. Yeah, that's that's the, the doozy that I was referring to But earlier. the core definition here, ultimately, is that we do not come up with this. We do not actively produce it. Rather, it just comes before us in our thought, is Kant's idea, right? I don't think blue. I see blue. And similarly, I don't think time. I think feel time is what he's going to argue later. We'll see that later. Um, I think it's a, an important term he uses here, objects. I think that's just a good way to think about it. Like intuitions are basically ob yes. objects. No. They're not really... Uh, they're not objects. Well, not, not all. They're not, the means not all through which objects, cognition relates to objects. Yes, like yeah, that's. So, so that's uh, but I think that's a good phrasing of it. Like I, I like like. Well, how I don't think it is a good phrasing of it because that would imply that we directly have the object, which for Kant the very point is that we don't. For Kant, yes, right. We, the, we, object yes. Numa, it, the object is the object of thought is mediated is by yeah, right, and it's mediated by intuition. By concepts, yes. right? Well, it's mediated by intuition, and then concepts is supposedly the representation that we're ultimately judging as true or false. So. To break that down, because that was very technical, mm. right? I see, a, a, I'm looking right now 
at the blue wall in, in Brothers College, right? In Brothers BC 101. What Kant would say is, okay, there's a noumenon over there. There's an object. And I don't have direct ob access to that object. It doesn't just pop into my mind. Mm -hmm. Instead, I see something. What do I see? Not the wall. I can't directly see the wall. I see blue. Okay? I see uh, a hodgepodge of colors in space. Okay? That's an intuition. Right? And then I conceptually say, okay, based on what I'm seeing, intuiting, what's given to me, that must be a wall. Right? And mm -hmm. so my representation of the object is a combination of this intuition of blueness in space with my concept of a wall and mm -hmm. yeah that's that's, that's a representation yeah. of the object basically and so in this sentence but, it's, but i think why i was trying to point out object is because it's sort of like the objectness of like this is what i was getting at like yes in it's not sense? the object like, it, because if we just have concepts, we're, not, we're never going to have anything that we could call an object. We're just going to have these ideas. It, what, it's what comes from the object is what Kant is saying. Yes. Yes. That's yes. what I was trying to yes, say. Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. For, for, was, yes. Yeah. For Kant, it is what comes from the object rather than that's being subjective. Yeah. Yes. That's true. That's true. And, and so what he says there is, in whatever way and through whatever means a cognition, namely, uh, I think I'm seeing the wall in BC 101, right, mm -hmm. may relate to objects i.e. the actual wall in BC 101, that through which it relates immediately through them, i.e. what is the thing that relates immediately to the object? It's intuition. And then he goes on and says, and at which all thought as a means is directed as an end. God, that's awful. <laughs> um, he's saying that all thought is directed as a means to an end. What is the end? Uh, intuition. Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a much more. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this this he should have just stretched this out, right? Yeah. So what he should have done is he said, I call intuition uh, whatever directly relates to the object prior to cognition. Hmm. What and then elaborated. The intuition relates immediately to objects, whereas other cognition relates immediately to them. Mm -hmm. And therefore, cognition relates to objects only through means of intuition. And therefore, right. the okay. end of cognition is intuition. That's what I would say. Yes, okay, yes, that, I follow That's how that. I would okay. explain what he's saying there. Yes, that makes sense. It's still like an awkward way to... S I mean, it's, it's a very awkward. difficult. It's a very it's, difficult. It's difficult and it's awkward because, like, when I think of this, I don't really think of like cognition really having like a means. That's very. It's very like um um like I, I e ethical way to like like phrase that. It's like yeah, means I might to an not end. even it's include like, that statement. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> like, I, I might not even have included that statement, but I wanted to keep yeah. his original meaning as closely as possible. Yeah, yeah, which is important. But right. it's just I'm just putting it out there that like yeah. it might not be helpful to think of if you're just trying to like conceptually understand what's going on here. Maybe don't put it in like the phrasing of like means as directed as an end. Maybe just think of like okay, yes, the the the, the point the, is the way cognition relates to objects is through intuition. That's objects really gives us something without us doing anything. Yes. That's well, the that's intuition. The the givenness is going to come. Just yes, a little, it's given. It, it's, it's not thought. Yes, which basically. is which is going to be elaborated. That's the core part. On more is that it's what's given to us rather than thought. Yeah. Okay, we can go forward. So this, however, takes place only insofar as the object is given to us. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's what. It, yeah, it's coming up. Yeah. But this, in turn, at least for humans, is possible only if it affects the mind in a certain way. Well, uh, yeah, obviously, mm. I, I think that's pretty clear. The capacity, receptivity, to acquire representations through the way in which we are affected by objects is called sensibility. Another kind of awkward phrase, but basically, he's saying here that how do we get it? How do we get intuitions from objects? Sensibility. Mm -hmm. It's just another name for, for it. Yeah. In intuition, we get intuitions through sensibility. That's mm. It's as simple as that. Objects are therefore given to us by means of sensibility. Repetitive. And it alone affords us intuitions. See, now that I explained it, the whole thing he's saying this is redundant. Yeah. Yes, but 
because of how awkwardly the yes. first thing was phrased, he just goes on to explain yes. it more. Yes, yeah. He, he repeats himself because he felt the need to explain everything all at once in a single sentence and then thought he didn't explain it correctly. So then he repeated what he said over and over again. In just again. a different way. <laughs> in a different way. Yes. Um, but they are thought through understanding and from it arise concepts. Aha, that's new. There we go. Yes, <laughs> There's the other new. half of the... Right. So the other half of the equation, right? Yeah. What's given to us, intuitions. Well, what do we think? That's an active process, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't just happen spontaneous i mean depends on how you define spontaneously but it, it doesn't happen without us is the most important part it doesn't just bleh, i passively mm -hmm. absorb thinking i have to actually think mm -hmm. right uh, i have to think wall maybe i don't have to consciously say wall in my mind but my mind has to do something to understand that that's a wall if that weren't the case a baby would understand what a wall is, which I don't think a baby does, right? They have to be taught what the word is. They have to learn what the concept yeah. is, right? So they are thought through means of the understanding, and from it arise concepts, okay? So what do we get through the understanding? Uh, concepts. So basically you have sensibility, which yields intuitions, and it's given to us. We have understanding, which yields concepts and we have to actively think it so basically the active part is sensibility which gives us intuitions the sorry no, no yeah the sensibility, is passive, sensibility yeah. is passive gives us intuitions thought is active understanding is active mm -hmm. and it gives us concepts mm -hmm. okay moving forward but all thought whether straight away or through a detour must ultimately be related to intuitions Thus, in our case, to sensibility, since there is no other way in which objects can be given to us. Mm -hmm. That's just asserted. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I was <laughs> going to say, this is this is why when like people are like, oh, Kant is like a rationalist. Like, I, no, <laughs> he's very much he very much thinks foundationally like experience and just just things for things for cognition to work. You need to be at least partially receptive uh, to uh, yes, you need to what be he's going to call receptive. Numenor. You need to be receptive. It's true. But he, he's not a total empiricist because he says No, he's definitely not. The concept. Because this is a priori yeah. intuition so is what we get into. Anyone kind of familiar with Kant's theoretical philosophy that's been like summed up quickly, usually what people like to say is like, oh, yeah, he synthesized, you know, um, empiricism and rationalism. And this I is, frankly agree with that consensus. Yeah, I, I'm not disagreeing, but I... It's just like obviously it's a little more nuanced, and we're gonna get in, yeah. get into that. But like th this is usually what they're like referring to is the, roughly this this paragraph here, and later on we'll see the the um, blindness and and um, what is it intuitions without concepts uh, are uh, so are empty empty and then, empty versus blind yeah empty empty and, and he's blindness and we're gonna get to that famous phrase and that's that's really the the core of how. Um, like I just said, it is more nuanced and it's more detailed, but essentially this is what's important to understand, and that this is Kant's sort of advancement of um, uh, uh, epistemology um, in, in this sense, because he's, he's blending the two theories, but um, he definitely is not really one of more or the other. People like to say, especially a lot of people like to place him in like rationalist camps for his ideas of like concepts and later we'll see like unity of like apperception and the understanding, the role plays in that. Some people like to place him more in the rationalist camp, but I, I think it's, they overlook the, the, this very important part, you know, specifically the last sentence where it's like, you know, sensibility is quite essential. Um, yeah. So I actually think it's important to, to see He definitely that. came originally from the rationalist school in terms oh, yeah, he of like did. historically. So yeah. like that's, I think a lot of it is like he felt the need to sort of defend rationalism. Yeah. And so that's sort of where this is coming from. Yeah. But I think ultimately it's more accurate to see him as a synthesis than as just a crypto rational. Exactly. Yeah. That That's the point I'm trying to make is you can't really downplay the role empiricism plays here either. Like people, especially because of his critiques of Hume as well, I think people are like, oh, he's just, you know, shitting on empiricism. It's like, no, he's he, he definitely places a much more he's, important thing than honestly all, than a lot of other German idealists like Fichte and Hegel. And I think Schelling, from what I understand, from what I've read, they yeah. they all they all play much more of a rationalist role. That Kant, Kant gives empiricism much more leeway than some yeah, of the others. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at his conclusions, ultimately, it's it's winds up pretty being pretty empiricist about a lot of stuff, except the natural law stuff, 
which we've taken yeah. objection with previously. Oh, yeah. Which was really weird. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> yeah. A priori, I know that the amount of matter in the universe cannot change. Oh, buddy. <laughs> Um, yeah, he Khan gets a little funky, but I mean, yeah, it's really important to understand that for Khan, and we'll see it a little later with the the, the blindness versus emptiness statement. Um, you, we'll, we'll see. The, the The important thing to understand here is that it's it's pretty much very equal in terms of like rationalist uh, faculties and empirical empiricist whatever faculties that both are stressed pretty equally in terms of like how knowledge works and how experience works all right you want to take the next two sort of mini paragraphs yes i will let's move on here it says the effect of an object on the capacity for representation insofar as we are affected by it is sensation that intuition which is related to the object through sensation is called empirical the under determined object of an empirical intuition is called appearance so we have more definitions here the first one sensation that I think it's pretty straightforward, yeah. Object on the capacity for representation as far as... Yeah, so basically we're affected... The way in which we're affected by objects, that is what sensation is. Um, and then intuitions being related to objects uh, through sensation uh, is empirical. So empirical objects are essentially us sensing intuitions that are related to objects. Um, which is kind of an interesting uh, distinction. I don't know if we want to look into more of the distinction between intuition and object, because that might be important for understanding this. Uh, well, um, object is a noumenon. Intuition is a phenomenon. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that was... It, it also doesn't... There's no substance... I didn't want to screw that up. <laughs> yeah, there's no substance to an intuition, essentially. There, it isn't anything, because mm -hmm. it hasn't been thought yet. It's, it's what he calls uh, a manifold. Basically, it's a, a, a confused jumble that makes no sense, and you can't say anything about it accurately. Mm -hmm. um, Until whereas it's paired objects, with a there might object. there might possibly be true statements about a noumenal object, but there can't really be any true statement about what intuition is mm -hmm. with any kind of precision. Like I can say, "Ooh, I see blue," but that doesn't. I mean, that's sort of a poetic. It's not true to say uh, X is blue. Because there's no X, mm -hmm. right? There's just blue. Yeah. Where's the Where's the subject? It's just predicate. Mm -hmm. Where's the subject? I have to provide the subject through concepts is what he says. Yeah. Okay. So that's that. And then uh, undetermined object of an empirical intuition is called... Oh, appearance. Okay. So appearances when they're not really like mediate, like undetermined. I, I think what, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what Kant means here is undetermined by concepts. Um, so it's like when you have, when you're not really like actively like using the faculty of understanding to apply concepts to, um, I guess in this case, an empirical intuition, it's just sort of like there and it's not really, it's just an, an appearance. Like there aren't, it's not really, it's not really something you fully cognized yet. I it's sort hope, of like, a, but seriously doubt that he's using appearance as one word here and a different word when he talks about the phenomenon, noumenon distinction. Honestly, I wasn't even thinking that far ahead. Um, well, it's back. It's back in the... He talks... The phenomenon noumenon distinction is in the introduction. Uh, oh, it is? Really? Yes. He no says... Way. Yeah. I don't remember that. <laughs> uh, let me see. Oh, this is the second aesthetic. Okay, let me see. I oh, is it in the A introduction? Yeah, we didn't, I think we didn't, so. We didn't cover... Okay. I, I think... Oh, maybe it's in the preface, actually, not the oh, introduction. Preface. I, I believe that's actually more likely preface to... Okay, somewhere on here, he, he first introduces the phenomenon, noumenon... Yes, yeah, so it's definitely in the preface, because he didn't, like, if it is there. It's, it's definitely beforehand. He talks about okay. the phenomenon, noumenon distinction. Mechanism, time to... Um, I could have sworn. Yeah, I didn't think it was there. Well, maybe I am thinking ahead. I guess so. Okay, but regardless, the point is 
that word appearance will be used in two different senses problematically I yeah this is one of the big things that he gets in trouble for and i think every as far as i'm aware like every post kantian big philosopher harps like gets on him for this like, um, i don't think they so really it's not a into... translation which i would expect because this is a very very rigorous translation yeah 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 <laughs> no it's it's I, I remember schopenhauer specifically had a big problem with it's the a ones. very I, I, I it's a very it. Dumb mistake, frankly. Yes, it is. I mean, it's we, quite, we, it's, not it's to, another one of his not to oopsies. shit on Kant even more than I've already been doing. <laughs> but like, this is this is this this is just the worst beginning. It's just a terrible. He's off to a terrible start here. Yeah, that's why people quit it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it like it gets better from here. But um, the problem with the way he uses appearance here is because he calls appearance the undetermined object of empirical intuition. But mm. later he calls phenomenon. Which includes determination, Appearances. appearance. Yes, yes. I was thinking that when I was reading it, but I wasn't. I didn't want to like get too much. Yeah. Well, it's a big deal. It's a big. Deal it is when a big he deal. He equivocally yeah. uses something he explicitly defines as a term. Yeah. It's like and it's one specifically of the surprising easy rules of being a philosopher. And he's got a doctorate. He's a doctor. He's not an amateur. No. What is he doing? This is. A, it's. A, he's, he's. He's not just even a. A regular PhD. This guy did a Cop- Copernican turn in philosophy. He, he changed he the field, doing? and he just and he just made this. Yeah, it was just a rookie mistake. Yeah, it's, it's if it's you quite bad. do this on your philosophy 101 paper, you, you, you will get, get points, points off. off. Yeah, do not define a term and then use it in two different, different ways. ways. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, he, he, here's the thing. Uh, actually, Schopenhauer put this idea forward, and it's an interesting critique. He thinks that it's not like as elementary of an error as that, he thinks it goes further. He thinks Kant was, like, confused by... He, he thought Kant's philosophy was inherently flawed this way, and mm. Kant, like, realized it, but kind of just hoped people wouldn't really, like... Because he didn't have it fully worked out, but he just wanted to, like, get it, get it out. And, yeah. and, and so he's like, yeah, he's like, Kant's... He's like, this isn't even just, like, a, a, a simple error like that. He's, he thinks it's an actual, like, fundamental, like, philosophical error. Mm. Kant just not really understanding how, himself how appearance works in, that in is, his philosophy. That's an interesting thought that we definitely don't have time to pick up. No, we don't, but it's... But regardless, keep that in mind for when, when we're going over... What is using phenomenon. appearance in two different ways? Yeah, yeah, either making an elementary mistake or misunderstanding his own philosophy. But yeah. either way, it's a it's it's a big problem. Keep, keep that in mind, and yes, good good to note that for sure. So, okay, so then moving on, uh, I call that in appearance, which corresponds to sensation matter, but which allows the manifold of appearance to be ordered in certain relations. I call the form of appearance. Wait, did I? Yeah, yes. That's right. Okay. You did it right. Yes. Since that, w- since that within which the sensation can alone be ordered and placed in a certain form cannot itself be in turn sensation, the matter of all appearance is only given to us a posteriori, but its form must lie already for it in the mind a priori, and can therefore be considered separately from all sensation. Honestly, I think this is like a brownie bonus points moment. That should be like a for- footnote or anything. The whole hylomorphism connectionism connection that he makes to yes. Aristotle's hylomorphism. Yes. It should have been a footnote. Like it should have been. It should have been footnotes. You think so? Yeah, because I don't think it's necessary to understanding Kant. Uh, I think it's just the fact that it's of a, course every philosopher reading this, except probably now because of dups some people in this particular group yeah. the vast majority of them have some familiarity with hylomorphism right yes this was made for like scholars exactly yeah. exactly so aristotle's idea of hylomorphism is the fact that okay the the, the idea that objects are composed of stuff mm-hmm. and shape matter and form mm-hmm. there's the basic stuff of the universe and then what's important about them is the way in which it's arranged okay so well, Kant does that and says, we don't have hylomorphism in the objects in fact, but instead hylomorphism of yes. our own mind, right? Yeah, we, a pri- have, we have the form, it lies right. a priori. There's, yes. there's a matter in, in terms of uh, intuition, appearance, right? Mm-hmm. Which and is given a, a posteriori. form, which is what we, we get a pro- posteriori, sorry, a priori, which is our own conceptual framework to explain what's going on there. So, yeah. so it basically moves the hylomorphism from like, things in themselves to like the mind which is because very, things in themselves is a very big issue for Kant which we'll get into later which is a very <laughs> interesting concept but it's actually I don't think it's essential to understanding Kant at all it's just uh, something every scholar would be interested in like historically uh, the 
specifically this 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 phrase right here but it's four must lie already and in, in it's mine a priori i think that's the essential that's that's new that the form must my lie in the mind a priori well he says because yeah, so, yeah i mean it, yeah. that is new but it comes also later it like, does it, it does exactly. yeah that, that that comes later okay so it's essential but maybe not here um yeah so the the kind of this whole starting with the appearance thing up until now this has been a lot of a lot of definitions and it's also like foreshadowing towards yeah. a much bigger issue which is that of phenomenon noumenon so read about that ahead if you'd like to um but that just note that is coming much later because we're gonna reel it back after this and talk about space <laughs> i don't know this is I, i'm noticing now this is like structured and like maybe even paced kind of strangely <laughs> The critique? Yeah, or maybe it's just yes. because we know it's coming ahead. I don't know. It's Yes, this, this the critique is, kind of, is structured and pay, look, <laughs> <laughs> no one, No one likes... I, I, I mean... I don't people, know. I liked it. No, I, some I, people have Stockholm Syndrome, and they like the way it's formatted. I did. It's just doing doing this now in real time. I'm kind of... That, that Stockholm Syndrome is leaving myself, and I'm like, damn, this kind of sucks. <laughs> 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 yep. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, because <laughs> it's like so much. Why are we studying it so intensely? Because I don't. Because it gets better later. That's why. It gets better later. It genuinely does get better later. If this is confusing, yeah. please stick along. And honestly, yeah, I think we should just try to move on so we can get there faster. <laughs> yeah, because we're just gonna be talking about things that people are gonna be like, "What the fuck is a noumenon? <laughs> what the fuck is a noumenon? Good question. All right. all right, keep going. All right, um, I call all representations pure in the transcendental sense, in which nothing is to be encountered that belongs to sensation. Which I don't know why I put in the transcendental sense because he just explains what that means. Out anyway, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> just keep going. Just keep going. Accordingly, the the pure form of sensible intuitions in general is to be encountered in the mind a priori, wherein the of wherein all of the manifold of appearances is intuited in certain relations. This pure form of sensibility itself is also called pure intuition. So, if I separate from the representation of body that which the understanding thinks about it, such as substance, force, divisibility, etc., as well as that which belongs to sensation, such as impenetrability, hardness, color, etc., something from this empirical intuition is left for me, namely extension and form. These belong to the pure intuition, uh, which occurs in the mind a, pri a priori, even without an actual object of the sense senses or sensation, as a mere form of sensibility in the mind. Um, so right uh, we here, we made a mistake earlier. What we called form concepts. It's not. That's not what he's saying. Did we say that? We did say that. Whoops. I don't. But that's even that's my that, mistake. Oh, okay. I, I'm pretty sure I said that. Okay, I was gonna say I don't uh, remember. It, saying. Yes. Okay. So so I'm pretty sure I said that and made the mistake. He's actually it is hylomorphism of the mind, but rather he's saying that, and now I understand why this this was necessary actually. Okay. So. The hylomorphism of the mind is that appearance, i.e. empirical intuition, sensation, right, mm -hmm. that kind of matter has to be organized in some way, namely, as we're going to get into, spatiotemporally, yeah. right, in time and space. Time and space are the forms. It's the form of the matter of intuition. Yes, yes. Right? Yes. So if I see blue, the, the, I can... I have to see blue in certain spaces and at certain times. At a time, yeah. Yes. And so that's a form of the matter of, of, of blueness. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where we're going. Um, which is for Kant a priori, which we'll see. Right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so then he starts dealing with very, like, um, Cartesian and Lockean, like, concepts of, like, uh, it's the basic, um, like, like John Locke separated them in, in like primary and secondary qualities and Kant's kind of like buying into that, um, but in a different way. Um, basically saying that like some, the, what Locke would call the uh, primary qualities, belong, uh, Kant is saying belong to our mind and what uh, Locke would identify as the secondary qualities would belong to... Uh, the intuitions of the objects. Am I phrasing that right? The s sensation. The sensation. Yes. Because empirical, it's empirical. It's yes. the important part, not just any intuitions. Yes. So, so uh, he's saying primary qualities belong to pure intuition, whereas uh, secondary qualities belong to uh, empirical intuition. Yes. Is the idea. Except okay. he places impenetrability, which Locke places as a primary quality okay so it's not one as to a one secondary okay. quality yes he changes it okay 
uh, which is a Cartesian move, I think. Uh, no, I would right? call it no. I, I, I don't know I that Descartes talks about impenetrability. Is it? He does well, positive. He does well. If he does, he doesn't have the scheme of primary versus secondary qualities to begin with. Is the problem? No, well, he he kind of does because he he doesn't use that phrasing. But what he does is he like tries to. Uh, he he tries to find like the substance of right of objects, um, and then yes, that's true. And then impenetrability, like, um, and then the other other things, oh, what okay. extension form. He does it in that sense. Um, I see what you're saying, but that supposes atomism, which Descartes does not suppose. He's agnostic about atomism. Where in Descartes do you read that he's like a, like a committed atomist? Because I don't think he is. Uh, I don't know about that, but he, what he, I, I'm almost positive in the meditations he brings up like impenetrability as this one. He doesn't really give like reasoning for it, um, and I never really looked too much well, into it. Well, it doesn't hold up but, with his own reasoning because if you take the candle, I mean, a, wax, a lot of a lot of no, things no, don't look, in Descartes. Look, look, take the candle wax. It's just basically yeah. right. Okay. The candle wax melts, therefore you can penetrate it. Right. The mm -hmm. only reason Locke has impenetrability as a primary quality that it actually exists is because he pretty much assumes atomism. Oh, so I, just, I might so just without, be confusing them. Yeah, okay. so, so without atomism, it wouldn't make any sense to say the wax is impenetrable right. because you can clearly penetrate it, yes. okay, right? Okay, okay. So, okay. so you have to posit that actually it's made of atoms which are smaller and which are impenetrable. Yes, okay, so I, I might have just... Does. Locke yeah. is an atomist. Okay, I might have just been confusing them then. But I don't think Descartes posits atomism. Um, no, at least not directly uh, in what I've read. Anyway, but my, my point in bringing that up is that... Um, what these philosophers were previously attributing to like objects in themselves, Kant is now drawing a distinction and saying, uh, well, as we'll see, really none of this belongs to objects in themselves, but some of them belong empirically to objects and some of them belong uh, like they're, they're, they're pure and, and a priori and, and belong to our mind. Yeah. Um, and that's really the important thing to get out of this. And if you're confused as to why empirical objects are not objects in themselves, we Stick around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's so keep going. I um, will go. Um, yes. I call a science of all principles. Oh, boy. <laughs> Principian. Okay, gotcha. Of a priori sensibility, the transcendental aesthetic. What do you think? Should I do the footnote now or later? Uh, just do it now. Get out okay. of the way, I think. So, the Germans are now the only ones who employ the word aesthetics to designate what that which others call the critique of taste. That's not true anymore, but it was at the time. Mm. <laughs> um, now everyone calls critique of taste aesthetics, basically. Yeah. The ground for this is a failed hope held by the excellent analyst Baug Baumgarten, Baumgarten of bringing the critical estimation of the beautiful under principles of reason and elevating its rules to a science. Uh, I mean, people are definitely still trying to do that. Mm. But this effort is futile. Note that this means that Kant's aesthetics do not like give us principles for determining what's beautiful or not yeah and here they don't yeah yeah they, well no in the in his aesthetics he doesn't oh i haven't read ju well it, critique it, of judgment so i don't know just in the critique of judgment regardless he says the effort is futile you cannot like rational oh wait no th th this is con writing this okay yes, wait Kant okay is writing I, I was confusing it with these no, okay is okay okay sorry you i cannot to, yeah. rationally critique art here okay yes anyway so here's what for the punitive rules of criteria are merely empirical as far as their most prominent sources are confirmed and can therefore never serve as determinate a priori rules according to which our judgment of taste can, must be directed. Rather, the latter constitutes a genuine touchstone of the correctness of, of the former. For this reason, it is advisable either, again, to desist from the use of this term and preserve it for the doctrine which is true science, whereby one would come closer to the language and sense of the ancients, among whom the division of cognition into Greek stuff uh, was very well known, or else share the term with speculative philosophy and take aesthetics partially in transcendental meaning, partly in psychological meaning. So all of this is a footnote because it's genuinely an aside. He's mm -hmm. simply arguing that aesthetics should not be used to refer to what we call aesthetics in philosophy. He's saying mm -hmm. that aesthetics should be about the science of sensation. Yeah. Basically. Um, yes, which is what he's been or, uh, describing. sensibility, not sensation, I should say. Yeah. I took it even when I was first doing it. Um, I just took it to mean just like, yeah, like sense experience in general. Um, well, sensibility is different from sensation in Kant. Yes. Right. So sensation is empirical, but mm -hmm. he's talking about pure sensibility, a priori sensibility. 
So not sensation. Right. Therefore. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. And that and it was and we can't a priori deduce like. If uh, you are a new student of Kant, I would recommend ignoring everything that I just said. He's just telling you why he used the word aesthetic when he's not going to be talking about why your painting is good or not. Yes, uh, he <laughs> he does have a book about that, which comes later, Critique of Judgment, and I ha personally have not read that. I've heard it's good, but uh, that's you? really – I've heard it's good. That, I've, I've, that's no, all. There's some good stuff in it. Okay, okay. Um, but that's if you're interested. Okay. Okay. Moving on. There must therefore be a science which constitutes the first part of the transcendental doctrine of elements, in opposition to which contains the principles of pure thinking and which is named transcendental logic. So there's a transcendental aesthetic dealing with sensibility and a transcendental logic which deals with thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the transcendental aesthetic, we will therefore first isolate sensibility by separating off everything that the understanding thinks through concepts so that nothing but empirical intuition remains. Second, we will then detach from the latter everything which belongs to sensation so that nothing remains except pure intuition and mere form of appearances, which is the only thing sensibility can make available a priori. In this investigation, it will be found that there are two pure forms of sensible intuition as principles of a priori cognition, namely space and time, with the assessment of which we will now be concerned. So to explain that, basically he's saying, okay, take all your thoughts, then take out, take out all the thinking part. Take mm -hmm. out all the thinking part. So now you have the jumbled mess, head empty, no thoughts. But you're still seeing stuff, right? Still seeing stuff. Which Great. for Kant, that works. And uh, I would understand, I had a big problem with this and still do. Um, I don't know if we want to like really get into that too much, but because uh, even just the phrasing, right, kind of reveals the contradiction. It's okay, take your thoughts and remove the thinking from those thoughts. It's like, well, I said thoughts to be. No, I, I know, I know, but like, take your representations would be the accurate term. Yes, but even even still, your cognitions. It, yes, but even still, it's like, for me at least, it's of my opinion that. Uh, you really can't take out representations without the thought. There's something inherent, which isn't here in Kant. Kant does not think this. Kant thinks you can do that, and that's fine. You can separate them. Many others don't. In fact, I would this say guy most hears about others. mindfulness. Oh God, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's yeah. gonna lose it. He's gonna be like, no, you can't just experience sensations without giving them a name. <laughs> I, I don't like mindfulness. Um, I don't like mindfulness. Um, but yes, uh, that's it's because it proves your theory wrong. What? <laughs> because it proves your theory. Wrong. No, I'm talking about <laughs> metaphysical sense, not just like oh, what, yeah. What? Uh, well, anyway. Um, to get back to what he was saying, yeah, that's what. <laughs> uh, he's not done because you can't just take out the stuff that you're seeing slash hearing slash feeling slash whatever. Um, you can't just take out the thoughts about it. You also have to take out all the stuff you actual sense. No color, no no um, feeling, no hearing. Okay, what's left? According to Kant, time and space are left. But that's really weird because not in my imagination they're not. In my imagination, I can't like even take away the intuition, the empirical intuition. It's impossible, right? So, what kind of representation is it yeah. that we have? It's not a cognition. It's not something I'm thinking and positing mm -hmm. because he already ruled that out. And it's also not something I'm imagining because I don't know personally. I I certainly cannot imagine time and space without something in them, even if that's just blackness, right? Yeah. Because then what would I be imagining? Mm -hmm. Nothing. So I'm not sure if According what he's doing... According to Kant, doing, time and space. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if what he's doing makes sense. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, in that sense, too, it's, it's a bit problematic. Um, I was going a bit more further. Uh, but, yeah, even just that is a little, a little strange. But uh, even if you don't buy this, like, process that he's describing in this last paragraph, what comes next is still quite um i think a kantian would powerful. argue that you don't need to actually be able to have a representation no. which yeah. is just pure space and time to know that they are prior yes that's what i'm saying is that even if even if you don't buy this and you don't think okay i can actually like try to do that in like my mind consciously. but it's not clear to me what the argument for space and time not being relational are then because there's the the counterclaim is that yeah. space and time are not pure forms of intuitions but relations between intuitions well if I can never conceive in any sense of space uh -huh. and time without intuitions, right? Mm. 
how do I know that it's that they're something prior to to, to sensations rather than um, rather than what's the word uh, relations? Yeah. How do I know? Um, which is super important because Kant. This is his big. This is this is something that is big and definitely like anti uh, um, empiricist. Is that he does argue that something comes like this. The, the space and time is going to argue or what make uh, experience like possible. So um, these are like the, the conditions necessary uh, is, is, a, is a popular way of phrasing it. Um, so it's super important, and we're going to see um, his arguments, and we're going to talk about them more next time. Is there anything else in this, this little bit you wanted to? Uh, I just want to say that the next, even the next section is easier than, than this nightmare. Yeah, this sucks. <laughs> so if you're still with us after now, uh, it's gonna get better. Even, like the next section is easier than whatever the hell this. Yeah, is. space and time are not super hard, and they're I enjoyed them when I first did them, and I'm gonna go through them again, uh, which I think will he be puts nice. Because forward a, a, an interesting theory, if nothing else. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's, there, I don't there's think I really... even heard of like the idea that like space and time exist a in the mind, but b also prior to everything else. I yeah, mean, it's super. It's super interesting and very like uniquely Kantian and very foundational to Kant's just philosophy and a lot of philosophies that will be built upon it. So, um, yeah, we'll be going to more of that next time. Uh, I'm trying to think if we'll do spit. I think I'll do space and time separately, but we'll at least do space next time. So hopefully you'll stick around for that. And uh, yeah, hope you had a. Good time reading this nightmare. <laughs> See you next time.